This is the Biology 1440 lab on osmosis, which starts on page 27 of your lab manual. And a few <clears throat> goals on today's lab include conducting an investigation on osmosis and plant cells. We're going to observe uh, hypo and hypertonic uh, solutions and their effects on Elodea cells, which is a kind of plant that's in the aquarium back there. And use a standard curve to determine the concentration of an unknown solution. It says salt there. It's actually sugar. I should circle that and fix it on the next edition of the lab manual. Okay. Um, and this lab is going to uh, end up being written up in a lab report uh, for 50 points. Um, but it's not due next week, so it'll, you'll have some time to work on it. But um, So rather than doing a figure this week and turning it in, you're going to be doing a figure, but it's going to be part of a larger lab report based on this week's lab. So just to just to warn you, you want to do a good job today if you can. Uh, now, a warning about this week, this lab can be a bit sticky because it involves sugar. And so we got to make sure we clean up after ourselves. I mean, we are already doing that because of the COVID, right? So just keep that in mind when you're cleaning up. Uh, it could get sticky. We don't want to leave a, a sticky mess in here. Um, one thing I might have you all do today, I, I got out some tape back there in the corner of the room and you can see the red and yellow tape back there. I might have you all flag one of your, at least one of your 10 mil pipettes with a piece of red tape. That way it's designated as the sticky sugar solution pipette tip and we'll use that for sugar all day. And then maybe the next slide can use it too, but that way we don't get all the pipettes all sticky. Um, just just uh, an idea and and at the end of the day you can always clean out pipettes by putting some water like just tap water in a in a beaker one of those plastic beakers and sucking water in and out and squirting it into the sink and that'll help to clean those out and keep them from getting gross okay so <clears throat> let me talk to you about what what's going on now so in bio one um, we start off with scientific method and lecture and lab a little bit. We talked about uh, basic chemistry so we can understand how cells are put together. And then we move on to, to cellular biology and cell parts and then how cells function, cell physiology. That's sort of where we're at in this course and where we're going. And this lab picks up on on a bit of physiology, uh, how cells get things in and out of, of their membrane. And we're going to focus today on actual osmosis, which uh, we'll define here in just a little bit. Um, you, you, I'm sure, have heard of diffusion. You'll be covering diffusion in greater detail in lecture soon uh, and, and osmosis. And you may not be quite sure how they're different, but we want to talk about that a bit today. Now, in the back of the room today, we have a big beaker, that big beaker back there of sucrose, that's table sugar, and it's a one molar concentration. And so <clears throat> we are going to make 30 mils of each of these concentrations using that stock solution, okay? We're gonna do that here in just a little bit. And there are places to do all that work on page 31 of your manual. So on page 30 and 31, there's a spot to write your hypothesis. There's a place for a graphical hypothesis. That's when you draw a graph of what your data will look like if your hypothesis is supported. So like if this is if this really happens, this is what my graph would look like. Not a real complicated graph, just a quick sketch. And then you can you can make a, uh, a dilution table on there as well as a data collection table and a, a spot to write notes and things like that. So we'll come back to this table. Uh, in a bit, but I, I want, why don't you go ahead though, uh, since I am recording this lab on PowerPoint, it makes it hard for me to go back to slides. So why don't we go ahead and just write down in your, in your manual uh, what concentrations we're making. Zero, and I'll put it up here on the board too. We're gonna make zero, oh, that's a dead marker. Zero, zero point two. Uh, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, and a 1.0 molar concentration uh, sucrose. So 
That is what we're going to make, and we're going to make 30 mils of each. So this is going to be uh, C2 and V2 for everything is going to be 30 mils. So we're going to have these different sugar concentrations, and, and we're going to have 30 mils, we're going to have them in those plastic beakers at our benches. We'll worry about the math here in a minute. <clears throat> okay. You're also going to go back to the back of the room where we have some potatoes. And there's a cork borer back there. A cork borer is a hollow tube that you stab into the potato and pull it out, and then you'll have a, a cylinder of potato, right? And we're going to use, hopefully there's a ruler at all of your benches. You can dig around in your bucket in a minute. You're going to cut five millimeter long cylinders. So you'll cut that one up into, into five millimeter long cylinders. And you're going to need one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of those cylinders, okay? And here's uh, how a student organized their data last time. They laid them all out on a piece of paper towel and they wrote down, they laid them all out and before they laid them out, they measured the mass of each one, okay? How much, how much mass they had. So they wrote that down. So there are scales back there as well. We can, we can measure the mass, right? So they laid them all out and you can see how much they weigh. Then what we do after that is we plop each one of those down into the containers of different concentrations of sugar that you have at your bench. So from zero to one, uh, one molar, you plop the potatoes in those. And we're going to let them sit there for at least an hour. And then what we do when that's done is we weigh them again. We mass them again, you know, maybe dry them off slightly and then mass them again. We see how their mass has changed over time uh, after placing them in those different concentrations. Okay, that's kind of the goal. So what I think we ought to do, and, and while that's running, while that's incubating, what we'll do is we'll do a few other little things. We're going to look at microscopes and, and uh, look at Elodea, which is an aquatic plant. We're going to see if we can dehydrate its cells with salt water. We can look at endocytosis, which is uh, how cells bring things in uh, uh, actively rather than passively like they do with osmosis or diffusion. And then when that's all done, we'll collect our osmosis data. And I emailed you all a link today of a data table where we can compile our class data again. And I'll have uh, table five and two work together because there's one person at each table so that way you don't have to do it on your own. Um, so we're going to collect that data, and I'll talk more about that as we get there. So that's kind of the outline today. Where the, you know the whole point of today is to to try to understand how osmosis works, why it works. Um, it's a really important phenomenon that's that's uh, going to come up again and again if you're studying biology, especially or, or medicine. So we're going to try to get a handle on it today. If you don't understand how it works, it kind of seems like magic, like things magically go from a high to a low concentration for some reason. But we'll try to explain it in a way that we can understand it, and, and then we'll have to write about it, of course, for our lab report. All right, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to pause this recording. All right, for those of you watching at home, I'll pick up the webcam here and turn it around for a second. Hi, everyone. <laughs> There's a table uh, that has the potatoes soaking in different concentrations of sugar solution that they have made. And they took the mass of each of those potatoes and they're gonna get the mass again at the end of the lab to see how those potatoes change in their mass. Did they get heavier, did they get lighter? Does anyone see any qualitative info now? Is anything floating versus sinking? If not, check again later, see if anything changes, but anyone, does, did anyone see anything floating? 
Yeah. Was it the higher concentrations? What's that? Okay. So. Oh yeah. So uh, the one. Where's your answer? Cool. Yeah. So the sugar solutions, just like the ocean, have a lot of dissolved things in them. You know how you float easier in the ocean? I mean, I don't get to the ocean much, to be honest, but I know you do float easier in the ocean. Uh, it's because of all the dissolved salts in the ocean, right? Dissolved sugars also uh, uh, make those potatoes a little more buoyant. Now, let's just talk about the basic principles that were that are at hand here. We have water, which is our solvent, and we have sugar, so, uh, which is uh, our, our solute in this case. So we have sucrose as our solute. And to understand diffusion and osmosis, you need to understand one thing first, and that is at the molecular level, if we could magic school bus ourselves down to the molecular level, um, hopefully you all have seen the magic school bus, uh, uh, if you could shrink yourself down to the molecular level, if there's energy around, which in this case heat, warmth, then molecules are in motion. So they don't just sit there, especially if they're floating in water, right? So they're able to drift around kind of randomly. Uh, thermal energy is powering that movement. Without that knowledge, this wouldn't make any sense at all. Okay, so. Just to give you an example, on this diagram here, we have a membrane which has openings in it, and we have water, which is the blue stuff, and we have dye, like food coloring. If you have dye on one side of that membrane, but the holes are big enough, that they're, 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 they're plenty big to let that dye through, and there's no stirring or anything like that, Just there's the water's just warm that dye will spread out over time and it will color the entire container of water on both sides of the membrane. And what happens is these molecules drift around randomly, some of them going through that membrane where, it's, where there are openings present. And, and eventually there's about the equal number of molecules on both sides of the membrane. So that's said to be equilibrium. So when it comes to diffusion and osmosis, things move from high concentration to low concentration, meaning high, highly concentrated to less concentrated, more spread out. So the thing I want to mention, though, is we do reach equilibrium here where, there, where we have an equal concentration of that solute on either side of the membrane, but that doesn't mean the molecules quit moving. They, they have reached equilibrium, but for every one drifting this way, there's another one drifting the other direction just because of the random nature of movement, okay? So it's not like it magically hits equilibrium and everything stops. It's just that everything's spread out and for everyone going that way, there's chances are another one going that way and they kind of counteract each other. And the same thing would happen if you had two different solutes on either side of the membrane. They would both cross back and forth until they're both relatively equal, uh, just randomly. Uh, and then they kind of stay that way. Now it's possible, it's physically possible and mathematically possible that, for example, all the yellow would end up on the left and all the purple would end up on the right again, right? It's possible. It's just not probable. So they could do that again. It's just not incredibly likely. So they're moving around. Now, that's just, this is just what we would call diffusion. Kind of like spring some, pretend there's no airflow in the room. It's just there's air, but it's, there's not fans blowing because that's cheating. And I would have a bottle of oh, Axe body spray, and I go, and it's right here. That's a high concentration of Axe body spray molecules, right? Eventually, it's going to smell way over there, right? It spreads out. That's what diffusion is like. It spreads out until it fills the entire space available to it, and those molecules get further and further apart. Now, osmosis is based on that idea, but we're adding a few more ideas to it. Here's a U-tube, a little different than the one we use every day, right? A U-shaped tube with a membrane. This membrane is big enough for water, but not big enough for the sugar. 
That's important to note. It's a selectively permeable membrane, just like our cell membranes. It's big enough to let water through, not big enough for the sugar to get through. That's how our membranes work. Our membranes don't let sugar through. Otherwise, uh, I mean, well, that's what insulin does, is it helps to create doorways to let sugar through. But normally, we don't let sugar into our cells automatically, right? So here's a, a, a simulation of that. Now, if we were to zoom in here, we can see uh, that the water is able to pass through the pores in the membrane. But the sugar is too big to fit through those openings. That, that's important. So here's how we start. We have a low sugar concentration over here, meaning a lot more water than there is sugar. And over here, we have a high sugar concentration. But the levels are equal in terms of volume on each side. But over time, this happens. The side that had a high sugar concentration has gone up. Now, look, did, did that side get more sugar or more water, the side that went up? More water. So it's more diluted now. It's, the water kind of diluted that sugar a bit, right? But the volume increased. So these two probably have the same concentration now of sugar solution, sugar to water ratio. But that means the one has more volume. Now, why in the world would that happen? Well, let's, let's, this is what osmosis is. So another idea you have to be able to remember to understand why this is happening. By the way, this is the kind of thing you might write about in an introduction to a lab report, uh, you know, when you're explaining a phenomenon. So, you know, if you, if you get lost in this and, you know, ask questions, etc. But anyone remember what it's called? When you have like a, an ion, let's say like a sodium ion in water, and water surrounds it and, and lines up with it and kind of dissolves it, and water for, well, I, I can't say it without giving away the word. Anyone remember the word? Hydration. Hydration shell. Thank you. Hydration shell. That's when, for example, let's say you have a positive sodium ion. I'll, sque I'll squeeze it up here. Then the negative oxygen you know, we'll, we'll kind of face face that ion, and that, that'll form a shell of water around that ion, dissolving it, essentially. I mean, the ion's still there. It's just surrounded by a sphere of water, a hydration shell. The same thing can happen with this great big water molecule. It's charged, and so the water can surround it and kind of stick to it, and that's how it dissolves in water. A hydration shell will form. So here we have sugar and water. We have water easily drifting back and forth through the membrane. It's in motion because there is energy in the system. That water can drift around, <coughs> left, to, left to right and right to left. But what happens to some of that water as it moves, especially, uh, especially this way towards, towards that sugar, where the, where the sugar is more concentrated? Water's moving in that direction. What's going to happen to some of that water? It's going to form what around that sugar? A hydration shell. So it gets stuck to that sugar. And now it can't come back the other way. Here's how I describe it. I'm sorry for those of you watching the video later. I'm going to walk off camera probably. But water is like someone leaving the bear's den at 2 in the morning which it's randomly moving around, bumping into things. Now, if I go out of this membrane, I can bump around and I can come back in. I have water. I fit through the pores. But what if I drift out and I get into a car or I sit on top of an elephant or whatever? Can I come back in? No, I'm stuck to something huge. I don't fit through the door anymore. So water is randomly moving, but it's getting stuck to this dissolved sugar, forming hydration shell. And so that water has a harder time crossing back the other direction. Now, not all of the water is stuck in hydration shells, mind you. There are free water molecules over there, but some of them are bound to water molecules, meaning they're stuck to something bigger. So overall, that causes this change. You get more water over here than over here because the water crosses this way, has a harder time coming back that way, and you have a change in volume. That is osmosis.
the diffusion of water across a semi-permeable membrane. And it only really what happens if that semi-permeable semi -permeable membrane has pores that are too small to let the solute through, but, it's, but they're big enough to let the water through. The water can move, but the stu other stuff dissolved in there can't cross the membrane, and that's when osmosis happens. Otherwise, it's just diffusion. They both cross until they were both equal on both sides of the membrane like in the previous slide. Now, if you stick cells into different concentrations of, of dissolved sugar or dissolved salt or whatever, you're going to have osmosis take place, and it's going to happen in, in different directions here. So let's start in the middle. If you take an animal cell, a red blood cell, and you stick it into a solution that has the same concentration of solute as the cell. That's said to be an isotonic solution. That means that the solute concentration that the cell is sitting in is the same as inside the cell. So there, as we see in the drawing here in the diagram, water is coming in and water is moving out at the same rate. And that cell, an animal cell was really happy in that situation. Stuff comes in, stuff comes out. This is what an IV is. When you give someone an IV, what do you give them? Distilled water? What's in an IV? I mean, like a non-medicated IV. What kind of solution? It's a saline solution, isn't it? Saline, I'm not speaking nonsense here. Have you heard of that? It's a salt solution. It's isotonic with your red blood cells. So water, it's the same concentration. So an isotonic solution, an isotonic IV, would have the same concentration of solute as the cells. So they wouldn't have any problem with that. Now, plant cells actually don't care for this as much. Plant cells prefer hypotonic situations, hypo. If you don't remember how to which these what these words mean, hypotonic, hypo, like hypothermia means like hypothermia is less than normal temperature. Hypotonic means less concentrated. Okay. A hypodermic needle goes beneath the dermis. It's underneath. A hypo means beneath or lower than. Okay, so. If you stick an animal cell in a hypotonic environment, that means the cell is sitting in an environment with less dissolved substances, with less concentrated solute. That's like putting a cell into distilled water. That's your zero concentration, right? Hypotonic. And an animal cell, what will happen in this case is water will diffuse into the cell because the cell has a higher solute concentration than, than the liquid it's in. Water will diffuse into the cell faster than it leaves the cell, and the animal cell will swell up until it lyses. There's that word again. Remember, we've I tried to point it out a bunch on the lecture videos. Lyse means to break, like Lysol. Lyses bacteria, right? Lyse means to pop. Animal cell will go and be done. Plant cells love this. They don't pop. Why don't plant cells pop? Cell wall. Have you ever eaten celery before? that have been in the fridge too long and get all droopy, right? That's because that celery is like this. It's, it's flaccid. It's central vacuole, doesn't have much water in it and, it, and the whole plant's droopy. Like when you don't water a house plant and it wilts. But when plants are in this situation, th this vacuum would be really swelled up. They don't really show that here. But it would be really swelled up and it would be pushing against the cell wall of that plant. Think of a water balloon inflated in a shoebox. It, it would act almost like a skeleton, giving it rigidity, and that's when celery is crunchy, right? So plants love that. They don't pop because the cell wall prevents them from bursting. Then you go to a hypertonic, sorry, the, 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 the C moved on there, but a hypertonic. Hyper means more than, right? Like a hyperactive person has more energy than I do. Um, so in a hypertonic environment, hyper means greater than. So this is when you put a cell into a solution with a greater solute concentration than the cell itself has. So all of these words typically, depending on how you use them, typically refer to the solution you've put the cell into. What's the concentration of the solute in that solution like compared to the cell? 
Hypertonic solution, it's in a very sugary or very salty environment. This is like our one molar. This is the one at the other end of the spectrum of our dilutions today. So what will happen here, that, the, the, there's tons of sugar in the solution and there's more free water, water that's not stuck to stuff in the cell than in the solution. Water leaves the cell, but it can't come back in because it leaves the cell and it gets stuck to that salt or that sugar and the cell dehydrates. It shrivels up. In the case of animal cells, they shrivel up like this. In the case of plant cells, they still have a cell wall, so they don't quite look like that. <clears throat> but their cytoplasm pulls away. And the word that's hidden behind my video here is plasmalized. Plasmalized is a fancy word for all the cytoplasm kind of thickens up and pulls away from the cell wall there. So that's what happens to cells in these different conditions. They can experience these different changes. I have a video that I did put on the uh, lab website. Uh, I may not play here, I'm gonna skip it, but it's a, what, what it's a video of if you get a chance to check it out. It's a chicken egg, I stuck it in some vinegar and dissolved the shell off of it, but it's a raw egg, it's not hard boiled. And I stuck one in Cairo syrup, and you can watch it dehydrate and kind of wrinkle up. And the other one I stuck in pure water and it swells up. It never ruptured, but it swells up. Now here's a thought question for you. I did that, and this is a real life thing that happened. I, I set the uh, eggs in lab and I had one in sugar solution and one in pure water. And I thought I'd leave them out all week so people could see them. One of the eggs was fine all week long. The other one got gross and moldy and frightening very rapidly. Which one got gross, moldy, and slimy and scary rapidly? The one in sugar or the one in pure water? I can wait. It's okay to swag. Scientific wild ass guess, that's fine. Water. 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 I see yes. So, let's talk about that. The one in pure water is in a hypotonic situation. Bacteria are fine with that because they have a cell wall kind of like plants do. They don't pop. So they could get invade that egg and make it gross and slimy. The one in pure sugar, which a lot of people think that one would grow a lot of bacteria, is surrounded by sugar, but there was so much sugar that it killed everything. It was just like having beef jerky, you know, it's salty meat. That salt dehydrates everything. So nothing was growing with that egg in that situation. All right, so before we move on to microscopes, then what I'd like you to do is you can work with your lab mate I'd like you to come up with a hypothesis then, because otherwise we're just playing around. We're not doing science. So you have your potatoes <coughs> in those situations. And, and uh, what you want to do is maybe first of all do the graphical hypothesis. So let me just show you this. So what would, here's sucrose concentration, here's change in mass. What would the data look like if nothing happened? As sucrose concentration increases, nothing would happen, right? If, if as you uh, increase sucrose concentration, if potato mass would go up, it would look like that. Or if as you increase sucrose concentrations, potato mass goes down, it would look like that. If it's linear anyway, right? If you think it's not linear, it might go up and plateau or something. So think about what you think the data will look like and then try to put that into words using the if and then format. If increased, uh, you know, if salt concentrations will cause potatoes to dehydrate, and I put them in different concentrations of sucrose, then this will happen. You know, try to put it into those that kind of wording like like uh, I've talked about online before. So see if you can work out a hypothesis. You don't have to be specific about which concentration will do what. Just general trends. In your experiment, what do you think will happen to potato masses as concentrations of sugars increase, for example? Work that out. So that's what the graphical hypothesis is. You don't even have to have numbers on the axes like what molar is just what will the trend of the data look like? Like 
You know, do you think it'll go up? Do you think it'll go down? Something you know, like that. Let me draw. Let me draw the opposite. It could be it could be either one, or it could be unaffected, and the line would just stay the same. The mass would stay the same before and after. spot you can put your hypothesis at the end of the lab today page 30 and 31 <clears throat> I guess I should pause this recording or otherwise I can show them the graph that I drew it might not show up back there you can kind of see it okay Okay, so everyone's had a bit of time to rough out a hypothesis. Um, so when you write your hypotheses, you want the if and then format. If is followed by what is really your hypothesis. A lot of times we do hypotheses wrong and we learn them wrong. Hypotheses are, are explanations, not predictions. So if and then an explanation, like if increasing solute concentrations cause potatoes to dehydrate because hydration shells form. You, you can actually make it really wordy if you want. You don't, you don't want to go over the top. But, you know, if increasing solute concentrations cause a potato to uh, gain water or lose water, you know, dehydrate or gain water, and I put them in various concentrations of sucrose, then this will happen. And so if and then. Um, and there are a few examples of those in your manual if you uh, need to check those out. So... That drawing of the data then is what you think the data would look like. Will the data go up at, or you know, will the mass change in mass go up? Will mass go down as potatoes sit in different concentrations of sucrose, right? That's what the, the graphical hypothesis is. It's just here's what the data will look like. Chances are the data, you know, the potatoes will get heavier as they sit in different concentrations or they'll get lighter depending on what you think is happening there. So what we'll do now while our potatoes are incubating, we're going to try to use our microscope. Has anyone used a microscope before? Yeah, so most of you have, good. Um, um, we're here to help you if not, but uh, we, I, do, I will introduce some basic microscopy stuff anyway. First rule of microscopes, and by the way, there is a set of info on, uh, in your manual on scope use and rules on 72 and 3. There's a really good diagram on 73, which would be a good one to look at and study because that could very well turn into another quiz sometime. <clears throat> at least it does a lot of times when we're meeting in person every week. This semester is weird, but we'll, we'll see what we can do, right? Okay, so a couple rules with scopes. I already got them out for you so we don't have to carry them. If you have a dirty lens, clean them only with lens paper. Lens paper it comes in these little booklets. It's not, it's not the Kim wipes at your bench. The, it's not those things that look like Kleenexes at your bench. And it's not paper towels. It's lens paper. And uh, there is lens cleaner. There's some in the back of the room um, in a little green, green jar. Uh, it's basically alcohol. And we can we can clean your lenses that way. If you go to high magnification, which the highest mag we will use in this course is the 40x objective. A few of the scopes have 100x, but those are oil immersion. We won't be using those. Uh, but when you go to that power, only use fine focus. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, when you're done with for the scope for the day, wrap the cord up. That way people aren't tripping over it. And I'm going to have you leave the scopes at the bench rather than put them away since they're used all week long. And of course, there's info in the manual on proper scope use there. <clears throat> Let me just walk you through the basic parts that we need to know about to survive today. The ocular lenses are at the top. That's where you put your eyeballs. They can rotate 
further apart and closer together to make up for the space between your eyes, okay? So if your eyes are wide set or narrow together, you can move it to make up for that. And at least one of them you can turn to adjust the focus slightly if, if your eyes have a different prescription and, and they, fo you know, they, they need a slightly different focus to see. Down below that is the, uh, oh, let me point this out. Right here on your scope is a set screw. Always make sure that's tight and never, never screw with the screw. Because students like to loosen that and pivot the head around sometimes, especially in normal semesters when they're like, hey, lab partner, look at this, and they pivot the head. Yeah, that's great. It does work that way. But half the time, students forget to tighten it back up again. And then when you pick up the scope, the head's wobbly and it can fall off. And that's about... I don't know, $1,800 in parts that just hit the floor if that head falls off. So we don't want to do that. So just leave it tight. Okay, down below is the objective lenses. Objective lenses um, are the lenses that you click in place. And we have a zero, uh, not a zero, I'm sorry, a 10. Uh, a four, a 10, and a 40 are the ones we typically use. So the, uh, the ocular lens is magnified by 10 times, everything by 10 times. The objective lenses tell you the mag on the side. So if you have your 40X objective in place, it's magnified by 10 times by the ocular lens. So that's a total of 400 times mag, okay? So our scopes range from <coughs> um, basically 40 times to uh, 400 times magnification is what we typically use. When you go to micro, you'll use oil immersion. You'll go up to 1,000 times to see bacteria, but we're only going to look at eukaryotes and things in bio one and bio two. Uh, you won't be doing uh, oil. On the side of the scope is a big knob, which is the coarse focus and a small knob, which is the fine focus. Coarse focus you can use at the lowest, the stubbiest lens, the lowest objective to get things in focus. And then you can sharpen the image up at the fine focus. As you go up to the higher magnification knobs, you really only want to be messing with the fine focus. And when you get up to the 40X objective, the lens and the slide will practically be touching, and you really don't want to crank on the coarse focus thing because you'll ram them into each other and you could crack one or both. You can even try it now. Move the coarse focus and you'll see that the stage, which is this part where the slide goes, goes up and down. So you'll want to be careful to make sure you don't make the stage and the slide bash into each other. On the stage is a little metal clip that holds your slide in place, which is really nice because on the side of the scope are controls that move the stage around. So you can move the slide around by turning those knobs while looking through the scope. That way you don't have to actually touch the slide with your finger and slide it around. <clears throat> Underneath the stage is the condenser that focuses light onto the specimen and an iris diaphragm. It's a little lever that lets more or less light through uh, because the, one of the things that cause students the most trouble is letting too much light through and washing out the image. Like, I don't see anything. And I just walk up and I dim the light or I move the iris diaphragm and boom, stuff shows up. Having too much light is often a problem. So keep that in mind. There's, of course, the light source there. There's a power switch and a light intensity control that lets you brighten or dim the light bulb as well. Uh, so you have those controls. So typically the best way to, to, do, to use this scope is you make a slide, you put it on your scope, go to the lowest power possible. Never go to a higher power on your scope until you've seen something. Otherwise you're just zooming in on nothingness. So you would move it, move it around, adjust the course focus until something becomes visible. And then sharpen that image up. And then proceed to zoom into the higher power. Now this scope is par focal, meaning... Uh, if you get it in focus at 4x and you go to 10x, it should still pretty much be in focus. So you shouldn't have to use the coarse focus anymore, just the fine focus once you get it at the lowest mag, typically speaking. Okay, And then you zoom in, and you might have to brighten the light up with the iris uh, as you zoom in to make it clear, because the, the higher the mag, the more light you need to see. So keep that in mind. Now, how many of you have made a wet mount before? Oh, good. So a good chunk of you, not everyone, maybe. We're going to be doing two wet mounts today. I think I'll have each partner do one of the two, and then you can swap and look at the other. The first one uh, is going to be uh, using Elodea, which is a plant back there. The other one will be with Tetrahymena, which are some ciliated organisms that I have back by the prep room door. Okay. 
Now, the way a wet mount works is you put a drop of water. In the case of the Elodea, it'll be a, a little leaf in a drop of water. And then you put a cover slip on it and you let the cover slip fall and it pushes all the air bubbles out. And then you look at it under the microscope, okay? In the case of Tetrahymena, they're swimming in water. You put a drop of that water on the, on the slide, put a cover slip on it, and you look at it under the microscope. The important thing is that you're careful with the cover slips because they're really thin glass, so don't cut yourself. And then you let the cover slip fall, and that pushes the air bubbles out so you can find what you're looking for. Now, there's two different sets of instructions here. How about we standardize this? Those of you on this side of the table, you'll do the tetrahymena slide. Those of you on this side of the table, you'll do the LED slide. So now you know which set of instructions to pay attention to, okay? Those of you doing tetrahymena, what you'll do is you'll add one drop of tetrahymena to the slide and one drop of India ink. There are bottles of India ink back here. There's a couple on the back bench there, and there's one actually sitting right here by the tetrahymena. Use this pipette to get the tetrahymena out. And then you can, what you do is you add a drop of tetrahymena, and you add a drop of, ah, oh, that's not any ink. That's chromothymol blue. There we go, there's India ink. Add a drop of India ink. What we're doing with tetrahymena is we're going to look for endocytosis, which is not diffusion. That's when cells actually eat things, they expend energy, and they bring things in that they really want. So they're going to eat that ink, or they might be eating bacteria stained with that ink. But either way, we should see that ink appearing as little black dots inside of the tetrahymena. So they'll actually, these are one cell big eukaryotes. They're just like you, they have a nucleus, they have mitochondria, but they're only one cell big and they bring in food through endocytosis, they eat it, and you'll be able to see that ink appear on their insides as little black dots as they eat it. Otherwise, they appear as clear organisms. So if you see black dots in them, you know it worked, okay? Now, those of you doing Elodea, typically I have partners do this. I, I, we're gonna try it solitaire today. Here's Elodea, it's an aquarium plant. <clears throat> this is what it looks like typically. See these, uh, under a microscope, see these squares? Those are plant cells. Those are the cells of the leaf. And those dots are chloroplasts. Those are organelles. So the squares are the cells, the dots are the chloroplasts. What you're going to do is, shown on page 30, I'm really good at this because I'm, I'm messy. So you're going to make a messy slide meaning you're going to add more water than you probably need to just fit under a cover slip. You're going to add enough water so that you have the leaf under the cover slip, you have the cover slip, and you have water outside the cover slip, okay? So it's like a puddle, okay? Then what you're going to do is what I would do is I would bring it back to my seat and I would look at it first. Have a look at it, see what it looks like. Get a picture of it with your phone so your lab partner can see it. We, I, I am very much encouraged pictures with your phone uh, in your scopes today. Best way to do that is to uh, put your hand around the uh, near the eyepiece and then lay your phone on your hand and then adjust how far away your phone is from the eyepiece and take pictures or video. Once you've seen the LOD, then what you want to do is get a drop of 10% sodium chloride. There are some droppers right back there that say 10% NaCl. You add a drop of that to one side of the cover slip where you have a puddle, and then you get a Kim wipe, which is these things that look like Kleenex at your bench. <clears throat> so you have a cover slip, you add a bit of salt to one side, you add a cover slip, uh, I'm sorry, you add a bit of salt to one side, you, you then uh, dab your Kim wipe into the liquid right there. What that's going to do is it's going to pull some of that liquid into the Kim wipe, right? But it's going to pull that salt under the cover slip. And that's going to cause a hypertonic situation to happen all of a sudden. So the leaves are in a hypotonic situation. Now they're going to be in a hypertonic situation. So one more time, the way that works, you have your, your leaf in a bunch of water. You lay a cover slip on it. There's a lot of water around the cover slip. You look at it. Then you add some salt to one side of that water that's sticking out of the cover slip 
and you stick a chem wipe or a paper, piece of paper towel in the water on this side of the cover slip and that draws the salt water under the cover slip and then what you should see is those cells react to that super salty environment all of a sudden okay and we'll talk about what you see or what hopefully you'll see when that happens it'll be harder because i'm trying to socially distance but i'll try to at least see your pictures if, if even if i don't put my head up to your scope we'll see how it goes this is all new for me as well so that's what we're about to do so i'm going to go ahead and pause this recording game can all right so if you put elodea in salt water what happens is it's now in a hypertonic situation water in the cells leaves faster than water can come back in and the cytoplasm dehydrates into these blobs uh, this is called plasmolysis now in a normal in normal water it's in a hypertonic situation and the, and the cells are happy they're fine but in this case they've plasmalized now in the case of tetrahymena they're normally clear and they swim around like crazy you might have thousands of them on a slide but if they're eating the ink you'll see little black dots appear inside in the food vacuoles and that's the ink that they've eaten out of the water or the bacteria that are stained black from the ink that they've eaten out of the water and you can see them inside then uh, inside their food vacuoles the next thing that would happen is a lysosome would fuse with those vacuoles and they would digest the contents of those of those vacuoles so that's active transport that's endocytosis that's when a cell actually eats something uh, using a little bit of energy to pull that off rather than osmosis which is just the random motion of particles causing these things to happen so hopefully I know we saw that if you didn't see it we, I know we saw dehydrated uh, uh, Elodea at these tables here this one I think we're just one drop away from pulling it off so make sure everyone checks that out and you see if, if you can't get excited about a sea of tetrahymena swimming around under your microscope then then you're probably uh, not a biology major but uh, but I hope I hope you got to see that and enjoy that if you haven't seen it make another slide we have a, a bunch of it back there so enjoy that I love the pond water and it's amazing to me that a drop of water will have thousands of organisms just swimming and those are the ones you can see with the na or with a, with a with this microscope uh, not to mention the countless bacteria that you're not seeing in there so what we're going to do after everyone checks that out uh, once everyone at your bench has seen everything the slides can go in the slide disposal box and you can uh, shut your scopes off and wrap up the cord and what I'll do in a bit is spritz them with 70% ethanol to sterilize them and uh, and then what we'll do here in about 10 minutes is we'll collect our potato data and we'll, and we'll uh, get all that class data recorded okay and then you will uh, you'll we'll talk about that and you're going to eventually be writing a lab report on this and your online lab next time or if you're in be watching this later the online lab for this week uh, and, or next week depending on your rotation is is what is a lab report what goes into a lab report so um, so keep that in mind so I'm going to pause this recording so while the last groups are collecting the last of their data I'll just talk briefly here so we've collected our data where your table data we're going to pull that into class data class data is what you're going to use for your report not just your table and I put a note at the bottom of this slide when you're doing your lab report don't forget to answer the questions um in your results section of your lab report the questions 10 and 11 on the bottom of page 29. those questions are what solution was isotonic relative to your potato and number 11 was what solution was what concentration was the unknown so for the question of what was isotonic to your potato that doesn't mean which of the solutions you tested was isotonic what i really wonder is based on your best fit line what concentration would be isotonic even if you didn't have one that was perfectly isotonic how would you know if something's isotonic what would the change in mass be in a perfectly isotonic solution zero zero it wouldn't gain weight it wouldn't lose weight right and so then the second one is what was the unknown so you can use your your graph as a standard curve to figure that one out 
Now here's an example of data from a lab like this one. And I have on here an example of how one could use the best fit line to solve for what the concentration of an unknown was, but you probably are going to have a lot of experience with that having done the beta cyanin lab where you're computing all those numbers using your best fit line. So you may not need to go over this, but you're going to once again, <clears throat> you are going, you know the uh, change in mass, you know y, so you'll have to solve for x uh, for, for the, uh, the unknown sucrose concentration. Now here's a way that students mess this up all the time, and I don't want you to mess this up all the time. The unknown is not used to make the graph. You don't know what its concentration was. It can't be used to make the graph. You make the graph with the known concentrations that you've made, and then you figure out what the unknown was after that, okay? And so you'll want to put the best fit line in there to solve for that. So in this case, to solve for x. So uh, if you know how much weight the potato gained or lost in the case of the unknown, you take that number, You in this case, you would subtract out 7.932 and you divide it by negative 0.386 and that would give you the unknown concentration. So, so for example, um, if, if you, if you, uh, um, if you know the unknown, if you, if you, uh, know one of the variables, you can solve for the other. Now, um, this works, this was a little different than the graph you made before, because in this case, the slope is negative because as you can see, as in this example, anyway, as the concentration of sucrose went up, the loss in potato mass increased. So it, it lost more and more mass as uh, the sucrose concentration increased. Now, in the, ex in the example that I have here, I have an example caption, but I want to skip that one. I want to show you the next slide. When it comes to interpreting your data, this is another place where students mess up. So your data is going to have, in this particular lab section, the one that's being filmed right now, there are four tables, right? So they're going to have a sample size of four, right? N equals four. And there'll be error bars on there and all that good stuff. This one doesn't show that because this is just one table of data. So there's no error bars on this data. But I want to show you how to, one, one thing to think about when interpreting this data. This is zero change in mass. So a lot of times students will hypothesize that the potato will lose mass as the concentrations increase. And that's kind of true here, but one thing to keep in mind that these two data points on this example, yours might not do this, I don't know. But in this example, these two data points are above zero, which means the potato gained mass in those concentrations. So you don't want to ignore that in your, when you're talking about what happened. Those potatoes are above zero, which means they had a change in mass that was positive, which means they absorbed water and got heavier. Whereas these concentrations lost mass and they were lighter. So something to think about. Something to consider when you're uh, writing up your results. Um, now this is going to be different for different lab sections. So I'm going to tell, warn the viewer at home that you, if you don't have me for your uh, lecture instructor, this may be different for you. So listen to your instructor. Okay. Now for me, this is important. Um, for me, your lab report rough draft will be due October the 2nd. After you've turned in your rough draft and before you do the final draft, which is October the 16th, I want you to make an appointment, probably online because it's probably how they all work right now, with the Writing Center, although now they're called the Communication and Writing Center, I think, or the Center for Writing and Communication. I have a link to it on the lab website in case you forget, but I want you to visit them and they will, they won't help you with your science, but they can help you with your writing. And so you can work with them uh, and that'll be five points of your total grade then will be uh, visiting the writing center. Uh, the final draft will be on the 16th. Um, so what you're going to do is you're going to write a lab report. There's, if you want to get started thinking about how that's going to work, Appendix D of your lab manual has all kinds of information. It has a rubric and it has what goes into each section. 
What you're going to do is you're going to have a title that's clear and, 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 and concise. You're going to have an introduction, which is kind of like my pre-lab. What is osmosis? Why is it important? For the love of Pete, don't start off a lab report with potatoes are blah, blah, blah. The lab is not about potatoes. Potatoes were the model organism to help you understand osmosis, right? The topic is osmosis. So introduce it. Why is it important? Why do you need to care? Use your book as a source to, to figure that out. <coughs> introduce it. Inter then tell me your hypothesis. And then you'll have your materials and methods section, which will just be a couple sentences of what you did. How'd you do the experiment? Then you're going to have your results, which will be your figure and caption, as well as a paragraph where you put verbally what the results were, not just the graph. But So the written results section kind of looks like a figure caption, only maybe a little more beefy. You might explain the qualitative data and quantitative data there. Then you're going to have your uh, discussion where you talk about whether or not your hypothesis was supported and you tell me why the data happened. Why did the data do what it did? Why did these things occur? And you can write about that. And, and you'll see what all needs to go into that section in the manual. Uh, and then, then there's a lit-sided section where you might cite the lab manual and the textbook. Uh, those, those are the only two sources I'm going to re require you to have for this report are your lab manual and textbook. So you, if you uh, talk about what osmosis is and you use some of the info from the manual, then you cite the manual. You'll probably want to cite the manual in the materials and methods section because it tells you everything you had to do, right? So you can cite that. Anyway, so if you want to get started on that, you can. Next week, you'll watch some videos on um, how to write a lab report for your online lab. And it'll help flesh out those ideas a little more. And you have a little time so you can ask questions. So, so this isn't due. The, the first draft isn't due until then. I'm mostly looking for a, a one page to a 1.1 1 .1, uh, and a half page paper here. This is not a seven page paper, right? This is a... Normally what I do is I require it to be one page because that makes students be concise and clear rather than trying to baffle me with BS, which is what happens if I try to make them write a seven page paper. <laughs> so I prefer concise science to lots of fluff. <laughs> okay, but that doesn't mean to uh, just leave stuff out. I'm you know, do a good job.